Hello, everybody. I'm going to get us started. I'm John Haig. I am the co-director of the Mosavar Romani Center for Business and Government. I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, as I always say at this, it seems like either Tom Wheeler is a phenomenal draw or the food. And I think we know the time. answer to that. And we don't want to answer <laughs> that too clearly at this point. But um, but thank you all for coming. Um, so today is um, a, a, the third in a series of these um, uh, weeks of seminars and study groups that we have. Um, uh, today, we're talking about the metaverse, cool new stuff, even worse, old problems. Um, and we've been covering the Digital Markets Act and EU regulatory policy and more broadly general antitrust policy. Uh, and so today is, is a little more entertaining uh, <laughs> at some level uh, because it's highly speculative uh, and highly kind of uh, uh, interesting in terms of raising regulatory questions about something that we don't know exactly how it's going to evolve. Um, so with that, Tom, I think most of you know by this point, but Tom um, is a businessman and author. Um, he was the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission from 2013 to 2017. He is currently a, a senior research fellow here at the center. Um, he's a visiting fellow at Brookings. And he's been involved in telecom and network services for over four decades. So uh, vast experience, both within the regulatory environment, but also in the business environment, um, which uh, brings a lot of value, I think, to, to kind of that regulatory perspective. Um, he led the, at, when he was at the FCC, he led the efforts around net neutrality uh, and any number of other issues. And as an entrepreneur, he started up or helped start up multiple companies. Uh, so again, brings a terrific perspective. Um, and I will turn it over to Tom, and then we'll always leave time for questions towards the end. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, John. Um, I would stipulate to the fact that we know why people are here, which is for the food. And I, one of the things I've learned about doing these multiple times <clears throat> with John uh, and the rest of you here is that the presenter needs to get here early, okay? So he or she can get to the food, uh, which I've which I have done, and so I will attest to its uh, its quality today. Um, but it's great to be here. Um, and um, as as John said, for the earlier part of this semester, we've been looking at the online platforms of today and the issues of today and addressing them from an antitrust perspective and from a regulatory perspective. Um, today, we're gonna move ahead to talk about what comes next and the relationship to what's happening today. And before I get cited for a section five violation of the FTC Act, because Gene and I believe strongly in FTC uh, important. The advertised topic here is cool new stuff, even worse old problems. And it leads to this question. When we have a new collection of technologies, such as the metaverse, are we gonna learn anything from the experience that we have had for the last couple of decades in dealing with the 2D platforms, uh, if you will? So let's start with making sure we're all talking about the same thing. This is the definition of the metaverse that the Oxford Dictionary uses. But I'd like to begin with a story. which was my first exposure to the metaverse. In 2014, uh, as John said, I was chairman of the FCC and I went to meet with Mark Zuckerberg. And, um, and we met in his fishbowl office, which uses entirely plywood furniture, but that's another story we can talk about. But, uh, and, um, and, he kept saying, um, when we're done, I want you to go across the street and look at Oculus. Because he had just spent $2 billion buying 
the virtual reality headset and, and, and accompanying software company, Oculus. So we finished our, our business and I went across the street to the Oculus lab. And I fought with dragons and I leapt tall buildings in a single bound. And I said to myself, what the hell does this have to do with social media? Thereby proving the difference between Mark Zuckerberg and me. Because what I learned from that experience is that what Mark saw that I didn't see was how social media and gaming were becoming increasingly participatory. You know, think about the move through the various stages of social media. Think about moving from, from Pac-Man to, to PlayStation to online multiplayer games. What's the trend in all of that? It is increased participation. And what Mark saw was that we are moving from social media to social virtual reality. And that's what the metaverse is. And that's why the issues of today's social media transpose themselves into the metaverse and why we need to be worried about what else the metaverse can do. <clears throat> so let me pause here for a second. <clears throat> there is going to be a lot of talk today about Mark Zuckerberg <clears throat> and about Meta um, because they have been out front on this in a big way. Uh, it's not to pick on Mark. It's not to pick on Meta. But it's just that they have done more to explain the vision and to begin to deliver on that vision than anybody else. So they have established the terms of the discussion and we're gonna have that discussion. So the metaverse is a technological pastiche, if you will. It puts together a whole bunch of things that we already know that we have seen continue to evolve from virtual and augmented reality, artificial intelligence, and the collection of personal information. And in a moment, we'll talk about how that means the expansion of the collection of personal information. But like any other new idea, it has both its fans and its detractors. So those who are bullish on the whole thing, here's a couple of quotations in our citations that, that uh, Gartner predicts by 2026, which is only a couple of years off, right? A quarter of the population will be in the metaverse for at least an hour a day. And another research group cites it as the next billion dollar opportunity. There are bears, however, right? CNBC, CNBC says, what is this? What's going on? And, and my favorite was this citation from the Wall Street Journal where they measured the population of, any, of people using the, 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 the Meta Horizon platform with the population of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and found Sioux Falls to be larger. But... What's more important than this debate is to realize that this is a debate that is happening now, but we're not dealing with something that is a snapshot. We're dealing with a moving picture. And in reality, we're dealing with a high risk thriller of a moving picture. And it's something much akin to what John Haig and I used to be doing, and the kind of debate that we lived through in the mobile phone business. And I just want to quickly walk you through this and, and ask you to think as an analogy 
to what's going on today. The first, the first mobile phone call, commercial mobile phone call was made in, from Soldiers Field in 1985. And, um, and at this point in time, we were, the, the McKinsey came in and was hired by AT&T to say, well, what's this business going to be? And McKinsey did their classic McKinsey work and came back and said, by the year 2000, there will be 1 million cellular subscribers in America. In 1993, I was the CEO of the Cellular Industry Association, and we celebrated our 10 million subscriber. So we were seven years ahead and 10x the production. And then these kinds of things develop where, where digital meant the end of the wall garden. And then Steve Jobs comes along with the iPhone and we saw this kind of growth. And I put this little red circle here. That was the McKinsey number. That was the McKinsey date. And as I say, they only missed it by 10x. But here's why not only does this tell a story about developing technolo technologically based businesses, but also I think it gives us an insight into Mark Zuckerberg's thinking. <clears throat> because in 2012, Facebook hit a billion wireless users. And for those of you who were following it, then you may remember that he almost missed the turn. And there was huge discussion about Facebook's goose is cooked. They haven't got a wireless strategy. He ran fast, scrambled, and successfully developed that strategy, had a billion users by 2012. And I think that that, in large part, informs the kind of decision-making of today. You can see the curve, and I don't want to get caught behind it this time like I got caught behind it last time. And here's his vision. So we're going to have an astrophysicist in the family. Actually, I have to write this paper. Will you help me? Let's take a closer look. What part of the solar system are we talking about? Saturn. If you were taking astrophysics, you could study in the metaverse. Did you know the rings are made up of billions of icy particles? Really? Look at this. You're ready to do that paper now, right? Yeah. In the metaverse, you'll be able to teleport not just to any place, but any time as well. Ancient Rome. Imagine standing on the streets, hearing the sounds, visiting the markets, to get a sense of the rhythm of life over 2,000 years ago. Imagine learning how the forum was built by actually seeing the forum get built right in front of you. So isn't that wonderful? It's so nice and warm and fuzzy and we're spending tens of millions of dollars buying ads like that on traditional media and, um, and, and, and online. But the message at the end is right. And if that is right, then the question is, what do we do about this? Because its impact will be real. And it's not just going to be improved education and improved medicine. And one, uh, one such ad like this, they've got a doctor who is a surgeon who is practicing a heart replacement um, in the metaverse before she ever has to talk, ever has to see a patient. 
Um, even got one where a farmer is talking about how the metaverse is going to help him with his crops. So if the impact is going to be real, how do we prepare for that? How do we deal with that? What's the relationship to today? So what do we know about this real impact? Well, this is an interesting interview question. The reporter from Axios asked Mark Zuckerberg. He says, is what the metaverse doing to ensure the problems of today's internet won't carry over into or worse get amplified by the metaverse to which mark responded don't worry we got time we can work this out no we don't it's been almost 20 years since facebook was formed and it wasn't the first social media network as you all know and the question is what have we learned and how does that inform where we're going well here's what we've learned one we've learned innovators make the rules this has always been the path to progress i don't care whether it's art or science or business it's always the innovators who make the rules because they see the vision. They see where things are going and they shape the reality for that vision. And that's what's happened thus far with social media platforms. But what have we learned along the way in terms of the problems that that kind of privatized rulemaking results in. Issues like privacy, issues like competition, issues like truth. And how are we gonna address those problems today, let alone going forward? And how are we going to deal with the fact that new apps like the metaverse create new challenges? Which I think boils down to the question of how are we going to have public interest oversight? I want to share with you one of my favorite quotes from American historian John Steele Gordon which talks about the kind of environment in which we're existing right now, but puts it in an historical context, historic context. He said, it's an old pattern of economic history that whenever a major new force, whether a product, technology, or organizational form enters the economic arena, two things happen. First, enormous fortunes are made by entrepreneurs who successfully exploit the new, largely unregulated economic niches. And second, the effects of the new force run up against the public interest and the rights of others. That's the moment we're living in right now, where we have seen Web 2.0 for want of a better description. And the realities that come up against the rights of others. And we now enter into a web 3.0 world, not having solved those and yet having additional ones to deal with. So let's look at some of the key points that I, made, I mentioned a moment ago. The, the, the innovators make the rules, for instance. And again, hooray, <laughs> you want them to do that. You know, I mean, just think of the great scientists, think of the great artists, think of the great business leaders of this country who had a vision that required them to break the rules. Here's one. 
That same visit that I was telling you about a minute ago, I was walking through Facebook's incredibly splendid new offices, which are designed to look as though they're never finished. There's still I-beams coming through the ceiling. As I said, it's plywood furniture, rough plywood furniture. I thought I was walking into an unfinished building. And Mark says, no, we did it this way because I want everybody to understand that our work is always unfinished and always a work in progress. And as I walked around, this expression was everywhere. It was written on whiteboards. It was painted on walls. My favorite was it was, it was outlined in yarn, <laughs> went around various push pins to spell out, move fast and break things. And now Mark has subsequently moved on from this, uh, but it has become the mantra of, of the era. And let's dissect it for a second. What are we breaking? It's not breaking things. It's uh, physical things. It's breaking the standards that have provided stability up until that point. And why do you do them fast? Because you want to get out in front. You want to establish behavioral patterns before. Now, this is my wife calling. So this is a, an existential moment here. Am I supposed to talk to her or talk to you? There you go, guys. Now you know where your priorities are. Um, the, uh, let's see, what was I saying? Um, and, and, and the things are, how do you get those things into patterns of behavior before people really realize what was going on? It's a great expression, and that's what it means. But I think that the thing that we have learned in the process is that it's, if you're looking for transformational forces, it's not the technology per se, it's the application of that technology. It's its secondary impact. And that's why as we see the metaverse coming, we need to ask ourselves, how do we get in front of these secondary impacts? So for those of you who are gonna be here Wednesday for the study group, we're gonna have a great opportunity to visit with Matthew Ball, who just wrote this book. It's an excellent book. If any of you have, have interest, I'm, I'm gonna chill for it here. Um, but this is one of the observations that he made in the book. Yes, it's gonna do all these wonderful things, but it is also going to render more acute many of the hard problems of digital existence today. Let's look at some of that increased acute issues. Okay, here's one we talk about a lot. We know that the online platforms capture private information and turn it into a corporate asset. I call it a digital alchemy, where they're taking your information and my information and suddenly it becomes The metaverse is going to bring us a new look to the kind of information collected. This is an excerpt from the Daily Mail talking about the patents that Meta has filed and others have filed as well, but Meta has something approaching 100 patents on, on this topic to capture all kinds of information because let's stop and remember it's, and recognize right now put on the headset and you are putting on a device to read your eye movement to your perspiration your heartbeat and that is information that is far different from what do you like on facebook 
That is information that ends up being more powerful than a lie detector. That it does more than answer questions about you. It collects information that can be used to manipulate you. You know, poets say that the eyes are the window to the soul. Neurologists say that the eyes are insights into what you're thinking and the ability to influence your behavior. This is a picture from the, 20, from the 2022 Symposium on Eye Tracking Research and Application. Who would have thought? <laughs> but from all over the world, neurologists gathered in Seattle. This is a presentation, a picture of one of the presentations being made. And I want to call out three things. First of all, look at what the presenter is wearing. He's got some augmented reality glasses. But let's look at what he's talking about. How my time at Ergoneers changed my mind. Ergoneers is a biometric software company that takes the kind of biometric information that gets captured by your eye movements and other things and converts it into applicable uh, information. And then, I don't know if you can see the pictures well, but he says, what happens in Vegas does not stay there. This is a presentation that is being made in Seattle. Why is he talking about Las Vegas? And here's a picture of the strip, and here's a picture of slot machines, because we all know how the platforms used psychological, the science of psychology to learn from what the psychological studies said about how to keep players at slot machines and to apply that same technique to keeping them online with social media. And so what he's talking about and what this whole conference is talking about is the fact that we're moving beyond psychological, the science of psychology to from manipulation to manipulate through biometric information. And I thought that this quote from one of the researchers at RAND was particularly on point. That when you are in a virtual reality environment, when it's not like you're just interacting with a screen, even if it's video, but you're interacting with a personally identifiable avatar we're relating to your personally identifiable avatar and all of this additional information is known about you that it really becomes key to emotional manipulation okay so that's one of the traditional issues we've known for the last 20 years right privacy how about one of the other issues that becomes more acute Competition. Gene and John have talked previously about how access to data is the key to competition and the platforms hoarding that data and denying it to others has a negative impact on competition. This is what Lena Khan the chairperson of the Federal, Federal Trade Commission said about the power of data to allow firms to capture markets and then erect barriers of entry by not allowing access 
to that data. And the thing that we have to be dealing with today is this point, that the power structure of the metaverse is going to be shaped about uh, around issues related to the access of the information, the kind of personally identifiable emotional information that we were just talking about a minute ago, and how access to that will not only shape behavior of individuals, but access to it will shape behavior of markets. So if access to data is the key to competition, and if platforms hoard that data to thwart competition, which is what Lena Khan was saying, our friends in, in the online world, and now the metaverse, are no dummies. And they recognize that. And we're now playing a game of word jujitsu. This is what Nick Clegg, who is the policy president of global policy for network for, for, for Meta and the former um, deputy prime minister of the UK said about this. He talks about data in terms of a file like the shirt that you buy at a metaverse conference that you'll want to take to someplace that is not a meta event. That is not the same thing as sharing the information that is essential to competition. But it's what gets held up as to, oh, you know, we, we, do, we do portability of, of data. Portability of data is different from interconnection of data, the sharing of data. And we've got to remember that as we engage in these discussions. Okay, the other area where it will get more acute. Who gets to make the decisions about how you augment this reality? So who knows, so, so, so you know more information about the user, they know more information about the user, and we know that algorithms create filter bubbles today that focuses uh, information so that you hear what you, what you want to hear. Here's the question that Casey Newton, wonderful uh, high-tech journalist, uh, asked of Mark Zuckerberg, where he said, imagine a world where everybody's wearing headsets and you're looking at the United States Capitol and one group of folks see a description that says, this is the, this is the building where the Congress works. And another group of people see something that says on January 6th, this is where the glorious revolution began. And, and Casey asks the question, who makes that decision? And what does that mean about our ongoing problem with misinformation and what is online truth? And here's Mark's response. It's one of the central questions of our time. In order to have a cohesive society, you need to have a shared foundation of values and some understanding of the world and the problems we face together. Yep, he's right. <laughs> it is a, a central question. Because the business plan is to break into tribes, is to break the market into tribes not to create this shared foundation. And for democracy to work, we have to overcome the tribal instincts, our individual tribal instincts, to find a common good. So let's think about what we have just seen. Collection of information that is more powerful tells more about us than a lie detector. The ability to manipulate emotions and actions with biometric data. And the absence of standards 
for how that works in the public interest. And that's just the beginning because the metaverse then brings us a set of other issues. We already have harassment online today, but imagine the difference with harassment that is your personally identifiable avatar being harassed by somebody else's personally identifiable avatar. There's a great story that the BBC researched um, that was entitled My Nightmare Trip into the Metaverse and was talking about the experience of a female BBC um, reporter posing as a 13 year old and how she was constantly accosted. And the response was, eh, it's the metaverse. I can get away with this. Or how about safety? If, if 2D, Facebook, TikTok, et cetera, affects young people's mental health, which is apparently what the, what the science shows, what happens when you're 3D and involved? There was a recent decision in the UK where a coroner ruled that a young teenage girl's suicide was attributable to her exposure to specific online platforms. Okay, well today, next issue. Today we have a digital divide. What about what happens when the metaverse comes along and turns it into a digital chasm? All right, there's the economic issues that are kind of obvious, but, but if the metaverse is run on artificial intelligence and one of the challenges today of artificial intelligence is some of its inherent prejudice, how are we gonna deal with that? What about larceny? There was a Gucci bag that sold in the metaverse for $4,100 or one of the avatars to carry around. What happens if it's stolen? How do you enforce that? And then my favorite is Benjamin Franklin's two certainties, right? Can you kill a personally identifiable avatar without consequences? You know, when I play video games, Call of Duty or whatever, and I'm killing people, I'm not killing you, an ident a personally identifiable person. And if indeed the reason why all this investment is being made in the metaverse is because it's gonna be a money machine, and that $4,100 for the Gucci bag stays in an economy that is existing in a pseudo world, how is it gonna be taxed? How are we gonna deal with that kind of issues? So the question becomes, how are we going to meet the new challenge? And, and to his everlasting credit, Mark Zuckerberg says, it's gonna take ecosystem building, norm setting, and new forms of government. Yep, bingo, you got it, right there. And here's what he said a year later, but we've got time to work this out. We know that in the marketplace, there is a first mover advantage. The lesson of the digital era is that there's a first mover advantage online as well. And establishing digital norms is a matter of getting there first. And if you go around saying, oh, we got plenty of time, I'm sure he's not saying to his folks, hey, we got plenty of time. He's saying get there first. So how do we make first mover work? for the public interest. What have, what have we learned? This, this is, I'm taking the 
when I was when I was doing these, I, this is the this is the positive approach. We've learned our lesson, have we really? <laughs> we know that we haven't dealt with the issues that have been caused by social media platforms thus far. What makes us think that we're going to deal with those issues, let alone the next set of issues? And dealing with the next set of issues is going to be even harder and particularly harder if we don't deal with the ones that are facing us right now. If we don't establish a benchmark in that area. Because we end up seeing an expansion beyond the kinds of bullets I was listing before about, about larceny and death and taxes and this sort of stuff. We end up seeing an expansion of issues which I think really become existential. The traditional real world issues, privacy, competition, truth, how they get changed. We saw that in the discussion of acute changes that Matt Ball talked about. But then the issue of add that to the pseudo world. And how do you establish policies that work in the pseudo world? So let's look at the first of those existential moments. And the question is, will the metaverse stimulate something new? And if so, by whom? Well, there's industry self-regulation. It's terrific. It's important. It needs to be done. And it's inadequate. I built the self-regulatory code for the American wireless industry when I was the CEO of CTIA. And let me tell you the two things that I learned about self-regulatory codes. The first is that they're only as strong as the weakest link, right? You've got to get a consensus of everybody agree. And, and the, the company that says, no, I won't agree, they control. Second issue is that there's no enforcement. What are you going to do? Shame on you. You aren't following the code. So yes, we need industry self-regulation, but no, we shouldn't be thinking of it as the be all and end all solution. Well, okay, let's have federal regulation here in the United States. How's that work for you thus far? The absence of the ability of the federal government policymakers to come to grips with the issues that have existed for the last couple of decades in, uh, in the online world is shocking. One of the things that I used to be constantly beaten up on by members of Congress on both sides of the aisle when I was chairman was you're trying to regulate the internet. And the conceit, the belief that had been sold that somehow if you regulate, you're gonna break the magic. So we've been unsuccessful and therefore don't see much promise in are we gonna have meaningful federal regulation? Well, okay, what's happened in this country when the federal government has decided not to act. So the federal government, after I left the, 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 FC, the Trump FCC repealed the net neutrality rules, California enacted them. So did like 16 other states. In the field we're talking about the metaverse, Illinois now has a biometric privacy law for the state of Illinois. Terrific idea. But what if it's slightly different from the biometric privacy law that Indiana might decide to enact? And how do we deal with that kind of, of, of interstate conflict? And then, of course, Gene, last time, 
led us through the discussion of what's happening internationally because of the fact that we have failed to act in this country. And there are two things that are significant in that regard. And we may be in a situation much like we saw with GDPR where it becomes a de facto international standard. And now with the DMA and the DSA, the UK has said that they will apply the GDPR, DMA and DSA to the metaverse. And then they said, but you know what we need to do? We need to open a proceeding in January to really understand what that is. So we understand what our principles are on marketplace competition, on the privacy of information, um, but we're not sure how to apply it in this new world. So let's start making the inquiry as to how to do that. Okay, existential moment number two. How do you have oversight? in a pseudo world inside that world. You've got to create a community inside that world. You know, Reddit's done a pretty good job of creating community and rules for that community in the world we exist in today. Are we going to see something like that in the metaverse? Here is another, a very honest appraisal from Nick Clegg, Sir Nick, um, says, hey, don't blame us. The problems that exist in the real world exist online as well because they exist in the real world. He's right. He's right. And we need to do something about him. But then this is what he told the Washington Post a couple of weeks later. You can't look to corporations like ours to oversee them. So what happens inside, what what's ha happens with the community that evolves in an unreal environment? And how do they have, how do they come up with their own sets of rules? Which of course brings us back to the threshold question here. And, and again, Meta is saying the right things. Nick Clegg says, we need a system of government for the metaverse. It must not be shaped by tech companies like Meta on their own. It needs to be developed openly with a spirit of cooperation between the private sector, lawmakers, civil society, academia, and the people who will use the technology. Yes, yes, Yes. And what's being done about that? This is not the answer. Those years are going to be used creating new challenges. We need to be spending the time thinking about an update to the rules. The experience I had, Gene will recall when they, they, when I would go testify before Congress, they would bang on me about permissionless innovation. The wonder of the internet is that it does all of this permissionless innovation. Nobody had to go get permission. As if anybody was suggesting that internet regulation should be like a prescription drug that you got to get approval of before you go off. But this, we have the years, is just another way of saying the same thing. It's just updating the same positioning slash lobbying messaging. And again, folks like Nick Clegg understand what's going on. Speed of which technologies have arrived, have left policymakers and regulators playing catch up. You bet, you bet. How do we play no more catch up? How do we get to a point where we're not scrambling? What was the line in, in, in Through the Looking Grass, the, the Red Queen said, now here, it takes all the running you can do to stay in the same place. We can't be staying in the same place, let alone 
sliding behind. So if we have no more catch up, the challenge becomes, how do you implement oversight? And that creates, that opens the door to a regulatory conundrum. When companies come in to government officials and say, oh, rigid regulations inhibit innovation and inhibit investment, they're right. You can't, if, if the answer is to micromanage a market, you are going to micromanage innovation out of that market. How do you deal with that? How do we move from micromanagement to agile risk management. And that's something that Gene and I and Phil Verveer have written, upon, written about at this institution. That if you go online to the Shorenstein Center, you'll see this paper in which we propose the creation of a digital platform agency, an agency with expertise rather than bolting this on to an agency that was created in the industrial era. That's the headline that everybody grabs on. And by the way, a built legislation uh, uh, proposing this has been introduced in both the House uh, and the Senate um, by, by, Senator, by Congressman Welch, now Senator Welch, uh, as of last week, uh, and by Senator Bennett from, from Colorado. Um, but the headline is a new agency. But what Gene and Phil and I, as guys who have spent their lives in this regulatory environment on all sides of the table, really labored over was not how the agency, whether there should be an agency, but how it should operate. The first thought is that it needs to be guided by the hundreds of years old common law concept of a duty of care. You know, the duty of care says, hey, if you are producing a good or a service, you got a responsibility to anticipate the adverse effects and do something about it. We haven't seen a duty of care in the online world. So let's instruct the agency that their job, the four corners of this canvas that they're to paint on, is the duty of care. Okay, that's the easy lifting. Now, how do you do it? And we believe that you need to bring into government the same kinds of agile management techniques that work in corporate America today. That, um, agency that I ran, the FCC, was working on a statute written in 1934. Things are a little different today than 1934. But in addition, that and other regulatory statutes, statutes were in essence mere images of the companies they were created to regulate. How did you manage an industrial corporation? You manage an industrial corporation on a rules base, rules basis. The guy on the shop floor, and he was a guy, the guy on the shop floor has a set of rules that he has to follow. He's supervised by some supervisors to make sure that you know, look at a half a dozen folks, making sure they're all following the rules. Who was then managed by a management level that make sure that all those are carried out. And we're surprised that we end up with a regulatory rules-based bureaucracy. We just copied. When regulatory agencies were being created, the management concept of the era was Taylorism. A guy by the name of Frederick W. Taylor. Here's how you get the most efficiency out of industrial production. Remove all choice. Remove all latitude from those who work for you. 
This is the way you do things. That flies in the face of move fast and break the rules and will not work for today. But that's the structures that regulatory agencies are stuck with today. So the companies have done two things. So our, our concept is how do we rip off from the companies, from the digital companies, just like they're ripped off from the industrial companies and take those things that work and make them work over here in government. And, and there are two ways of, 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 of doing that. One is the standards process for coming up with rules. How did we get from 2G to 3G to 4G to 5G? As technology changed, a new standard was created by the industry that allowed the evolution of the technology. The standards making process is a multi-stakeholder process where all those involved in the industry sit down and basically negotiate how this is going to work and how they protect themselves in their role as consumers. All right, how do I make sure that my widget will work with that Fornistat? And, um, and, and so we said, let's have a standards-based process in which companies and the government participate that can bring agility to the process to keep up with the kind of changes and not to inhibit innovation and investment. And then secondly, let's have somebody check that to make sure that it's not a lot of pretty words sounded full of sound and fury signifying nothing and then enforce it. And we and 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 if we have this kind of a structure, then we have the agility to deal with and continue to respond to the changes not only that exist today, but that are coming down the pike with blazing speed. And so the question here is that, at least to my way of thinking, the metaverse should be the impetus for doing this. We can see this coming. Let's address the problems that we have today. Let's get in front of what's coming. This is not the answer as a way of overseeing the public interest. Thus, this, oh, wait a minute, this, is impact is real and the impact on the companies and their responsibilities is real. And while the metaverse is today, like the wireless industry when John Haig and I first got into it, very rudimentary, we get in front of these issues today then we perhaps have a chance of bringing public interest to the equation. And that means that this becomes more than a rhetorical question. Thank you. Questions? Anybody got any thoughts? Yes, ma'am. Wait a minute, we got to get the microphone so that the... Hello, hello, okay. Uh, hi, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Uh, one of the most fascinating uh, talks I've attended here at HKS, I appreciate it. My name is Sama, I'm a junior at the, at the college actually. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about like getting out in front of technology and actually like being able to regulate it. Um, I guess like, you know, you talked a little bit about like the government's like um, inability to kind of like catch up with the technology, but I, I'm actually curious in another way in terms of like, how do you prevent this like technology from being like misused for other purposes? Because sometimes um, I've heard about like software uh, 
for, for example, I've heard about like Apple software being applied in China and the Middle East for surveillance and censorship purposes. Um, so I'm just kind of curious, um, like how would the government be able to like regulate the misuse of this technology and prevent it from being weaponized? So what I've been focusing on, what we've been focusing on is the marketplace impact, the consumer impact, um, if you will. It is a very legitimate question that you ask and one that gets even more profound by what we see going on in China and how China and other countries are seeking to, to, to use the te technology as a tool of international influence, if you will. Um, and um, uh, all I can say is I agree with Mark Zuckerberg that we got to work it out, but I don't agree with him that we have time to work it out. And we got to start having this debate right now. And I'm glad you raised it. Sir, sir, and then Professor Nye. Hey, my name's Sam, uh, MPP2 here. Your platform agency idea, what are the probabilities of that agency occurring and what could be some pathways of actually implementing it? Um, passing anything in Washington these days is very difficult. Um, Gene and I are strong believers, however, in you start, you've got to have the discussion, you've got to get that discussion into the water supply. And, um, and at some point in time, something will occur. Folks will be looking around. And oh, here's an answer. But it's terrific. It's been introduced in the House and Senate. We hope it'll be introduced in the House and Senate again uh, for the next session of Congress. Um, and, um, and, and, and hopefully it will become increasingly an item of discussion because the question that will first be addressed is well, let's just bolt something on to the Federal Trade Commission or some other kind of agency. And in that discussion, there ought to be, no, wait a minute, is there a better, more efficient way of, of, of doing this? We hope ours does that. Professor. I thought this was a terrific presentation. I followed every slide agreeing with it. I came to the end, I thought, I wonder if there could be one more slide. And Please. If so, <laughs> if so, what would the bullet points be? Suppose we had up there, what is agile risk management? What would yeah. some of the bullet points be? It's great, bingo. It's a great question. Agile risk management is I tried it three times at the FCC. Okay. All three were repealed by the Trump FCC. But the but the concept <coughs> is. Here are the four corners of expectation. Go ahead, operate inside those four corners. And I'm gonna be watching and I'm gonna have a conduct rule to watch what's going on. And we'll be able to respond with dispatch and say, this is, I, I see what you're doing, but it is not within the four corners of this. And um, you can't have an MVP, a minimally viable product in government, unfortunately, right? Because, because um, um, by definition, that doesn't provide enough certainty for corporate decision-making. But you can say, here are the concepts. I expect you to follow those. I will be watching what goes on to try and manage risk. So for instance, on net neutrality, what we said was that we will, we will, and, and this was, well, what we said was, yes, you will be a common carrier, but we're going to excuse you from almost all of the traditional micromanagement rules that came with common carriage. But we are going to have a new rule, the general conduct rule, which is going to allow us to say, no, that's going too far. Don't do that. 
And um, so it was our attempt to, to move in that direction, but that's the- yeah. so, so it comes down to the level of the abstraction of the rule. Yeah, yes. Yes, ma'am. Let's go. We'll go over this side. Um, just in like a broader sense, I always feel a bit skeptical of um, propositions of a new agency as a solution to yep. problems because I think they're often um, captured. The, yeah, or there's you know the same issues in the wider context. Right. Um, do you think there's, uh, you know, continue to exist? They're going to, you know, they're just going to become obsolete. They work for the current settings, you know, you know, um, like, what do you think around this? Is it digital? Was it the digital platforms agency that you're proposing? Like, what do you think around this? Like, in structurally, are protective factors that you think could mean this is a, yep. as, as, a, as a solution? Yep. Great question. First of all, um, not doing anything is the ultimate regulatory capture, right? Okay, so we got to do something, right? Um, and uh, our thought process is go back to this concept of a bolt on versus a new agency. Yeah. Why not bolt on? Because, I mean, let's talk about the Federal Trade Commission is a terrific agency populated by hardworking people, dedicated people. Um, I, I was quoting Lena Khan, the chair one up here. She's doing a fabulous job. The problem is she's also responsible for overseeing funeral homes, and she's had to have some enforcement in that area. She's, in for, she's, she's responsible for the labeling of, uh, of the products that you have that has a little tag on it that says, here's how you use bleach. Um, my, the classic example, she actually had an enforcement action on hockey puck labeling. Okay. Her responsibility is the entire economy. All right. What we're seeing is we have somebody who is focused on digital, has digital expertise, and wakes up in the morning and worries about that. The second issue is that an agency like the FTC has limited rulemaking authority. She's trying to do something about that right now, whether that gets through court or not is a different issue. But, um, uh, but, um, but you need somebody that can say, here is the rule that applies generally, rather than here's the rule that applies to this company in and through an enforcement, like you know, the $5 billion fine against Facebook for not following their own privacy rules. Has no effect on Google. There's no effect on TikTok, et cetera. Um, and so how do you have an agency that wakes up in the morning and says, today I'm worrying about these digital issues, not hockey pucks. And again, nothing against the FTC. They do a great job, but just focus, focus, focus. Are we we have time for a more all right, we'll take two or three at a time. Yes, we'll just go this way, all right? Hi. Yeah, sir. Uh, I'm Hugh. Uh, I'm curious. I feel like in the public perception, there's still pretty like haziness about what exactly the metaverse is going to be and not that confidence is actually going to pull off. Do you think that that adds to some of the uh, like headwinds for regulatory motion in yes. this direction? Yes. Okay, cool. Great. But it's not a reason not to show up and play the game. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I want to go back to the agency question, which uh -huh. is, um, I totally agree that there should be an oversight agency, but who should Could sit on there? Could you stop there, then that's fine. Thank you, we can go to the <laughs> but, but But who should sit on there and where do they come from? Yeah, great question. So so what we need are, we need people with, with, with skills in the space. One of the troubles that we have with regulatory agencies today is that they end up getting populated with lawyers, especially lawyers who used to work on Capitol Hill. Um, nothing against these these people, but um, there should be some expectations that we're going to have folks who um, have cut their teeth in this. I mean, I felt that I had a different experience as chairman of the FCC than others um, because of the fact that I had run businesses, because of the fact that I had failed at some business. Fortunately, it succeeded in others. 
Um, but um, but that, that it gave me um, an appreciation for the issues that we're dealing with in a real world environment, not just a legal environment or a legislative environment. So I, we think it ought to be a commission, okay? Five people headed by a chairperson. Um, and it ought to be bipartisan with the president's party controlling. Um, and, and we will stipulate that it ain't perfect, that it is about 8,000 times better than nothing. Sir. Thanks, my name's David, I'm an MPP one. I'm wondering to what extent do you believe that people's purchases and ability to make quick purchases should be regulated in the metaverse? And real quick, the reason I'm asking is because you touched on a lot of the ways that these companies have their fingers on physiological dials and they can be very good at variable yeah. reward schedules. And so here's what I'd like to see specifically, okay? I mean, what a great question. And, and, and what, the, what the agency ought to do is to say, okay, we're gonna address this question and let's have the companies come back to us and say, here's a standard, okay? We know, for instance, that, um, that there, is, there is nutritional labeling on cereal to help you make a decision um, on, on cereal and, and, and food products. We know that there are lemon laws for automobile purchases so that if you get a lemon, you've got a period of time. We know that we have a holder in due course doctrine for when you, when you charge things on your credit card or when somebody fraudulently charges something on your credit card. Okay, now, this is the challenge. Evan has brought up a great question. Let's get this multi-stakeholder group. You've got six months. We're gonna be participating, by the way. You got six months, come back, and we will assess with the ability to have line item vetoes and edits the decision that came forth and move forward on that. But, but I think that that's something that you handle. Um, again, I, I, don't, I don't, the federal government shouldn't be saying there has to be a mandatory 48 hour wait, but there can be standards that the industry recognizes are good behavioral practices that can be put in place. You want to deny you had anything to do with this presentation? No, no. So you have to understand, Tom and I, I ran AT&T's international operations. I ran new services for AT&T Wireless. And we interacted when he was at the CTIA. Um, so we have a, a, a long history. Um, a couple things I, need, I want to emphasize. One is um, my experience, and I think this is borne out in the, in the, in the re broader reviews, is that these kinds of technological changes always go slower than everybody thinks, but then when they happen, they go very quickly. Yeah, until they don't. <laughs> right. And then all of a sudden it, right. it just happens really quickly. And I think there's a, my experience in this, um, I'll just give you a couple examples. In 1994, I was advising the CFO of AT&T Wireless, AT&T about the purchase of Macaw Cellular. And that was, we were gonna pay $12.6 billion and every business case said that was crazy. That was way too much money. And when you map out to get there, you have to show this vision of the future that nobody believes because it's so different from the vision today. But you say, this will be the heart of the company. In 2004, I helped sell AT&T Wireless to Singular, which renamed it AT&T Mobility. And um, Singular paid $41 billion for AT&T Mobility, AT&T Wireless at that point. And everybody said that was crazy. That was way too much money. And if you look at the market cap today of take um, AT&T, it's total AT&T, not just the wireless business, but total AT&T in September was $120 billion. If you look at Verizon, it was about $170 billion. If you look at T-Mobile, which is just a wireless business, they have none of the other activity, their, their market cap was 178 billion, right? So there's almost negative value attached to some of the other aspects of the old telecom business. Now, the reason I bring that up is because companies, old line companies oftentimes have such a hard time adapting to the technological change. So it's not just the government lags the pace of change, 
but so the business companies. lag sure. <laughs> lags the rate of change, and and it creates for such a complicated environment. And to to Joe's point, I mean that's what drives the need for a kind of that agile, flexible government regulatory structure to kind of manage, you called it risk management, I would say managing kind of huge uncertainty, uh, both in terms of the end state and, and the timing in which it's, it's gonna occur. So I wanna thank everybody for coming. I do wanna remind you that on um, Wednesday from 12 to 1.30 um, in Rubenstein 414, which is across the hall, we will have the metaverse, how to deal with what we know is coming continuation of this, but more importantly, Matt um, Ball is going to be there. And just so you know, Matt is a VC and a CEO of something of a company called Epila, Ep Epilion. I don't know how you pronounce yeah, it. Um, and he wrote the book that Tom mentioned. Uh, and so that will be a continuation of this uh, session. You're all welcome to come. And again, thank you all for, for coming. <laughs>